I challenge the most solemn and serious gardener not to raise a smile when they look at something like that. They're like sort of comic book stuff. Look at that, even the little ones, they don't have to be great whoppers. It's just a lovely, funny object. <laughs> We've grown many more squashes this year than ever before, which has meant we've had loads of cucumbers and courgettes, and now we've got winter squashes and, of course, great big pumpkins. And they are a very good organic crop because they smother the ground so you don't have to weed and they're no trouble at all. But they are a very greedy crop, so they need loads of water and really rich soil. And when people talk about a rich soil, they mean adding plenty of organic compost. A compost heap is really the centre and epitome of any organic garden. You take all the waste, whether it's from the kitchen, tea bags, vegetable leftovers, whether it's from the garden, grass cuttings, thinnings, anything you don't want to eat, that heats up, rots it all down, and then in time makes lovely rich humus which you return to the garden, which enriches it, conditions the soil, and makes things grow more, so you've got more to compost, and so it goes round and round. <laughs> However, they do have to be turned, and it's a lot of work doing that. Um! It is important to do it, though, because by turning it, you introduce oxygen. They heat up to as much as 60 degrees centigrade, and that kills off disease, it kills off <coughs> fungus, weed seeds, the whole lot, as well as speeding up the rotting process. <laughs> A sign that your compost heap is working is the presence of these red worms. They are the agents of decomposition, and if you've got those, it'll work nicely. If there aren't any worms in your compost heap, the chance are there isn't enough aeration and you need to turn it. This is the finished article, as well as a, a nice outdoor dog bed. And as compost heaps go, you can't improve on this. We started this last summer, and we've put all our grass cuttings, our vegetable waste, anything all rot down, went on this heap. We've turned it twice, and all winter and spring, it rotted down. And now it's ready to go back into the garden and keep that cycle of enrichment and renewal going. And you can tell when compost is ready, because it should be positively pleasant to smell and to touch, to handle. There's really nothing yucky about good compost at all. Our compost supply was put to good use this year when we created a new squash patch. First, I had to plough the previously uncultivated field using one of my favourite toys for boys. The compact clay soil needed a lot of opening up to make life easier for the pumpkins and courgettes destined for this bit of ground. By late April, it was just about warm enough to think about sowing squash seeds. Squashes of all kinds are hypersensitive to the cold, and they're all grown in much the same way. The cucurbit family includes pumpkins, squashes, courgettes, melons, marrows, cucumbers. Now, that's a pumpkin, Turk's turban. That's a squash, Jack be little in it. And here we've got a courgette there. And here we have a cucumber there. Sow into individual pots rather than seed trays, loosely filled with organic potting compost. When sowing different squashes in one session, label the pot first to save a lot of guesswork later. Place each seed upright, not flat, using one seed per pot for pumpkins and two for the courgettes and cucumbers. At least one of the two should germinate successfully. The seeds need a minimum temperature of 16 degrees to germinate, so a heated greenhouse is ideal. And because squashes are thirsty plants, keep them well watered. About a month later, the seedlings will have grown big enough to pot on into a larger pot 
so there's space for the root systems to develop. Really important not to press it down. The next stage is planting out, but only if the weather's right. Weather is obviously absolutely critical at certain times of year. It's always important because you're always trying to fine tune everything and be responsive to what's actually going on. And in spring, when you want to plant stuff out, a frost can ruin everything. And again, at harvest time, so the end of summer, beginning of autumn, it can really spoil what would have otherwise been a brilliant harvest. So I don't want to plant the squashes out. If there's any chance of frost, because particularly when they're small, that will just wipe them out. And even if the book says, you know, plant them out in the middle of May, if there is a frost forecast, you want to forget it. Be 100% certain that it's safe. And for the record, this year, we had a freak frost at home on June the 9th. But whatever you decide, make sure you harden off your squashes for a couple of weeks before you plant them out. Although we've manured this, I'm adding a bit of extra compost because they're really greedy plants. When you think these great big squashes or pumpkins, huge leaves that can grow as long as, I don't know, 20 foot in some directions, that's got to have nourishment. So as rich a soil as possible, which is where our heavy clay is great, plant them in the hole. So there's a, a saucer around it, a depression, so that when it rains, they get plenty of water because they need lots of water, lots of nutrition. I space these about a metre apart, which is as close as you'd want, because you want lots of space for these. It's one of the great joys of living in the country. You have more space, and so you can grow things like pumpkins and squashes. But even if you've just got a small garden with a compost heap, that's ideal for growing at least a few plants. With all that goodness to feed on, squashes are in heaven. As they grow, squashes develop great sprawling, triffid-like leaves that cover the soil and suppress any weeds. But until then, it is worth mulching to do the job. We put a layer of recycled cocoa shells, which is an acceptable alternative to using weed killer. During the summer growing season, water the squashes regularly and then just wait patiently and enjoy life while the great baubles get bigger and bigger. No, I'm... Freya, you go? No, why me? I <coughs> can't both be on here, I get off. At this time of year, any of the flowers that grow want to develop into squashes, but they're never going to get big enough or ripen in time and you're taking away potential growth from existing fruit so we pinch off the flowers and that means that the pumpkins and squashes that are half formed will go on growing and get bigger and you don't have to throw the flowers away because they are delicious deep fried and other than just pinching off the flowers which isn't vital there's really nothing to do to these things is grow Pumpkins and other winter squashes take about a hundred days to flower, set fruit and ripen. The secret is to leave them on the plant, basking in maximum sunshine for as long as possible. But don't take any chances if frost is forecast. Oh, that's disgusting. Now, these are called Turk's Turban because they look like a Turk's Turban and if you think that the pumpkins and squashes are all gourds then it becomes slightly less mystifying that they're all these funny shapes and in fact we just got a few there are dozens of different types all of them weird shapes and most of them really good to eat now doesn't that look fantastic this crazy surreal harvest all spread out on the ground Mind you, how am I going to eat them all? I don't know. If the weather was going to stay like this, we would leave these, like, along here, to dry in the sun. 
but the forecast is really wet, so we'll probably have to bring them in. Sunshine makes the skins harder and they keep longer as a result, but don't leave them on wet ground or else they rot, and if it's going to be frosty, you must bring them indoors. There are scores of different squashes to choose from, but the truth is they all taste pretty much the same. But as a rule of thumb, the bigger they are, like this Rouge Dief Detente, the less flavour they have, but that's certainly worth roasting and using as an accompaniment. Turk's turban is a bit of a fiddle to peel, but it's very good tasting. You can eat it roast, you can fry it, you can make soup from it. These little Jack B. Littles, rightly as they call Jack B. Little, very nice roast. You wouldn't want to do anything else with that, roast it whole or cut it in half. These Golden Delicious are pretty much the perfect flesh because they're really dense and what I like to do with these is make soup from them because that dense texture is great in a thick winter soup. Now, I just want to wipe it down to get all the crud off. Not that you're going to eat the skin, but it's nice to work with a clean machine. Now, we're going to need about a quarter of this, so cut the top off like that and then cut through the middle, which can be quite tricky if it's a really thick skin. I'm sure this is going to make people anxious, but if you go carefully, it's not too bad. Actually, this is going. There she goes. Now, lovely orange flesh, and of course that colour will go into the soup. Now, we need 750 grams. I'm not going to measure this out, I'm just going to use a quarter. And obviously take out the pith. I want to take the skin off, so I'm going to roughly cut it so it's manageable to do that. Actually, this one is not fully right. Probably do with being left for a week or so more, but it doesn't matter. It just means I have to cook it a bit more. It's not like eating an unripe pear or anything. Right. Now I'm going to cut this up into smaller squares so that when we cook them, they'll cook quicker. Just sort of half inch cubes, really. Heat a generous tablespoonful of olive oil in a large pan and let the pumpkin sweat for a minute or two. Add a couple of medium-sized potatoes, also cut into cubes. Throw in two chopped tomatoes. Stir them about a bit. Then add a pint of stock. Now this time I've used an organic powdered vegetable stock, but stock of any kind will be just as good. Let that bubble away for a bit. And then add a few leaves of fresh sage. The whole thing needs to simmer for about 15 minutes or so until the potatoes and pumpkins are really tender. Now, this should be sufficiently cooked so it will whiz up in the liquidizer. Just soft enough so you can match it. This is a thick soup, so it doesn't matter if the whole affair is a bit chunky, and we don't want to get rid of the lumps, we just want to blend them in. I suppose this is the sort of soup that people would call hearty. And the pumpkin will give it that. Right, quick burst. Put a bit of salt and pepper in. It's a thick soup, but we don't want it to stand up. So add a bit of liquid. It won't affect the taste at all. We put it back into the saucepan that we cooked it in. Amazing colour. Then put it back on the stove to gently reheat it and taste it for seasoning. A thick soup like this is much better with some crunchy texture. You know, you might use croutons, but a good alternative is to finely slice some fresh sage leaves and briefly fry them in very hot oil. 
They go remarkably well with the soup. Very good, huh? Why is there grass on the top? Grass, it's sage. Get myself a spoon. Nice and red. Yeah. Crust or crumb? Crust. Now, did you put those chisels back? They're mine. They're not yours. They're mine. My eight-year-old son, Tom, prefers talking about tools, which he's mad about, than pumpkins, which, you know, he can take or leave. But I could wax for hours about the joys of this vibrant, fun, huge... And I've put on my boots to go out because it's... It's a real statement of intent. It's like, I don't know, a footballer lacing up their boots before a game or strapping on your armour because it means I'm not just going out to empty the dustbin or something like that. I'm going out to do something. They can't get me. I'm going outside and I'm not answering the phone. I'm going out to play. Come on then. Life. Yeah. By midsummer, the garden is at its peak, and this is what all the months of work is for to enjoy that luxury of colour and abundance. And the garden is literally overflowing with every kind of ingredient. Just as pumpkins belong to autumn, courgettes and cucumbers are at the most succulent in summer. We grow our cucumbers in an unheated greenhouse. We can also grow them perfectly well outside. I used to think that cucumbers were limited to finely cut sandwiches and rather boring salads, but in fact there are a lot of things you can do with them. You can even cook them, for instance. I just got to cut some spearmint now. It goes really well with cucumber. I'm just going to lightly fry the cucumbers and then I'll add a little bit of cream and then sprinkle on the mint last of all. It sounds a really odd mixture but actually it works really well. We cook this to go with something light like chicken or fish and you need two small cucumbers or one big one to feed about six people. Well, they don't really need peeling but the skin can be a bit tough and bitter sometimes. So once you've cut them in half you then quarter them long ways so you get nice long slim pieces of cucumber. It's a lovely fresh pale green. Well, this can go in the butter now. You have to watch out the butter doesn't burn. Well, this will take five to ten minutes depending on how fat the slices of cucumber are. And just while that's cooking I'll just go and chop up the mint. I have to strip all the leaves off the stalks. The stalks are too coarse to eat. Spearmint is the best type of mint to use for this because the leaves are very fine and delicate and much smaller than apple mint, which has got rather fat, hairy leaves, which are just too coarse for this recipe. I'm just picking through to see if there are any bits of insect life because it hasn't actually been washed. It was watered this morning, so it's lovely and fresh, but no, I think that's fine. And just chop it quite finely, but absolutely at the last minute, because otherwise it starts to go black and doesn't look so good. And the smell coming up from it is just fantastic. The whole kitchen is full of the smell of mint. It's lovely, it's sort of aromatherapy. OK, I think that's done. Right, well, those look ready now. And just, it's easy to turn them over, they're just nice and brown underneath. But because the cucumber's got a very delicate flavour, it does need quite a lot of seasoning. I like them salty, so salt on. I love black pepper. Plenty of black pepper. Just a bit of cream to give it a sauce. Maybe two tablespoons. And just heat that through. And that will just bubble away. It's thickened slightly. And just to finish it off, lots and lots of chopped mint. 
cool minty cucumber, fresh fish. This is summer on a plate. For a summer supply of cucumbers, you need to get sowing by April. As with all the other squashes, you need to keep them warm and watered as the seedlings grow and pot them on into individual pots if more than one seed germinates. The cucumbers need support to keep the fruits from lying on the ground, so carefully tie the stalks to a cane before they take over the whole greenhouse. Create a really humid atmosphere and never let them dry up. And if there aren't too many fruit dangling from a plant, leave the yellow flowers where they are and that will give you a continuous summer supply. We actually went over the top a bit this year, growing other sorts of summer squashes. This is mainly because once you harvest these sausage-shaped yellow courgettes, they grow back incredibly fast, as do the round green ones, and they keep on growing right up to the end of summer. They mature much quicker than pumpkins and have thinner, edible skins. It doesn't matter if you have too many. The colours look great and they're incredibly versatile in the kitchen. And these are three of my favourite ways of preparing them. To make deep fried courgettes you first have to mix up a batter. Separate an egg and then add eight fluid ounces of cold water to the yolk. Now give it a stir and then add four and a half ounces of plain flour and then whisk it all together. Now cut the washed courgettes into diagonal slices, dip them quickly in the batter and pot them in some very hot oil to about 180 degrees. It only takes a couple of minutes for the batter to get crisp. Then fish them out, season them and eat them as soon as you can or put them in a hot oven so they don't go soggy. A simpler way of cooking them is just to roast them. The yellow ones can be cooked whole, but just so that they cook evenly, you might have to cut up the green ones. Just to add to their flavour, you need some slithers of garlic, a splash of olive oil, and some sea salt and pepper. And then roast them for about 20 minutes until they're nice and tender. Finally, before serving, sprinkle lots of fresh herbs on top. This is golden oregano, and that's it. If you have some fresh baby courgettes, they make a delicious summery salad. Use a peeler to cut them to slithers. You don't have to peel them because the skin is edible. Add some basil leaves and then some shaved parmesan. And for the dressing, olive oil and some lemon juice. So you can have a lovely fresh salad, crunchy tempura, or rich roast, all from a courgette. Not all the summer squashes get eaten because there are so many that a few get too big and tough. But they're not wasted because they end up on the compost heap and the goodness in them will in time return to the garden as part of the organic cycle. And compost is never rubbish. It's the lifeblood of the garden. And by autumn, when all the squashes are harvested, it's time for a final tug of war with the huge leaves and long stalks that are left behind. But next year, all this goes back into the garden as compost. Thank you.